So I recently decided I wanted to build a uh, tachometer and this is my attempt. Uh, for the sensor, we want something that can sense the intensity of light falling on it. So uh, first, the first choice is a photodiode, but I'm actually using an LED, um, which is in this roll of tape here. This is just to collimate the light. Um, so, you know, well, <laughs> to attempt to collimate the light at least. Um, so LEDs can act as photodiodes if you just uh, wire them in reverse. Uh, but we do need to amplify the signal, so that's why I'm using a couple of transistors. Um, this is, I think, it's called like a Darlington configuration for an amplifier. Um, you can do it with one transistor, but the amplification is just not not really viable for something like this. So um, I've got this configuration. I'm taking the signal from here, and you see the LED is wired in reverse. And that's uh, that's important because if it was wired the other way, we'd burn it out, um, and probably the transistors as well. But um, this way, we get some small reverse voltage when light falls on it. So uh, all the LEDs can be used this way, uh, and then actually solar panels can be made to emit light as well. Um, it's just they don't do it very well because it's not what they're designed to do. Um, so when you when you look at the signal from something like this, uh, if we normalize it here. Um, it looks a bit like this, so it's a bit noisy. Um, and if we want to, if we you know pass something in front of the uh, LED, we'll get you know some output like this, um, or a higher frequency. It will look something like this. Uh, but we have to do quite a lot of work to kind of get a usable signal. So uh, we need to smooth out a lot of the noise and the jitter that we get. Um, so I do this by using two methods. Uh, one is to keep a kind of register of say the last 10 values and then use the mean of that so we have kind of a ring buffer uh, constantly adding the newest value so it's a bit like a running total but it's a, a running mean I guess um, so that's a, that, that takes it 10 values to uh, averages the last 10 and then that's what you get for each reading uh, but then that alone wasn't enough so I also had to use a, a low pass filter um, so I just kind of <laughs> copy pasted that off the internet. It seemed to work quite well. I tried a few different uh, algorithms and uh, ended up on one that gave me good results. But then we have some. We still have some more problems. So if we look at the um, the example I've drawn here for the uh, low frequency, um, it's quite clear, and we get a large threshold um, between these two, the low and the high values. But at a higher frequency, the threshold has actually decreased. I don't know whether this is just um, if all photodiodes do this or if it's just because I'm using an LED, but that was really problematic because you know if we set, we have to figure out where this is, right, and then adjust accordingly. And um, initially, I tried to do this with this potentiometer, but that was just completely impossible to do by hand, really. Um, so in the end, I've uh, I decided on doing a similar thing with uh, in, with the signal processing where. I keep a register of you know the last n readings, and use the minimum and maximum from that to determine the midpoint. And I think I'm using a hundred readings, but we can't use every single data point because you know say we measure once per millisecond, that's a tenth of a second. Well, you know anything less anything you know less than a tenth of a second, the whole period is uh, not going to be readable. So um, actually, I, I you know I skip a few values. So it's not going to be exact, but we'll probably get a threshold that's pretty close and in practice it works fairly well so that's this kind of dynamically adjusting threshold um, <coughs> so I'll give it a demonstration I've got a, a round bar chucked up in the drill um, just with a piece of tape on the end so this will periodically interrupt the kind of signal from this the light from this lamp uh, in front of the sensor and hopefully uh, my demonstration will work so uh, one thing I did was to allow, make it easier to convince myself that the uh, readings were working. Uh, I, I repurposed this bar, little bar graph here. I was going to use it something else, but uh, I repurposed it just to pulse whenever we get a transition from low to high. So we can convince ourselves that it's working fairly well. So, you know, we get this, this reading here. Um, if I slow the drill down. So, I'm trying to do three things at once, hold the camera, change the drill intensity and keep everything in, uh, concentrate on what's going on. So 
try and slow it down as slow as I can. So what, one problem with this um, maintaining this kind of this history uh, with the threshold is we need to make a history that's at least as long as the maximum period we want to measure, right? So uh, this low to high value, um, we need to maintain, you know, maybe two seconds worth of history. So that's why, you know, we'd need a register of 2,000 values if we were doing one measurement per millisecond and we get every measurement. So uh, the nano has 2K of RAM, so it's not going to work. So I'll do this as slowly as I can. So th the limit is about two seconds, something on that order. I don't think this drill can actually go slow enough to demonstrate. Um, you know, there. 23 seconds, 23 revolutions per minute. Um, I'll just do it by hand. I'll try to. One thing that this really uh, demonstrates is when you when you try and wave past something once a second, uh, you almost always end up doing it faster than that. I guess because you get bored trying to time it. Uh, so 21 FP revolutions. Come on. Right on the cusp. If I wait much longer than that, it's gonna. There we go. Yeah. So we just. The initial, the initial reading is a bit off, as you can see. Um, we go into this kind of error state, uh, and the way I calculate that is just say like, if the threshold is such that the gap between these two is, you know, less than a certain defined amount, uh, then we just go into this state where we, we're not really displaying anything. Um, so it's quickly how it works then. Um, this bottom half here is all. Uh, just for driving this display. It's a little bit perverse because um, <laughs> I was maybe a bit over optimistic having six digits. I don't think I'm going to reach uh, that <laughs> that level of uh, frequency with this device, but um, maybe I can use it for something else. But I'm using one of these Max uh, 72, what was it? Max 7219 chips. Um, these are really good for driving uh, seven segment displays and dot matrix displays and things like that. They'll, they'll do up to um, I think it's 8 by 8 uh, or 8 digits of a 7 segment display. Um, so I'm using one of these, but unfortunately these are common anode displays. Uh, so I don't have a driver for the common anode display, so I went ahead and used some inverters uh, just to invert the signal from this. Um, so, <laughs> so this display is a lot bigger than it needs to be, um, but I used what I had lying around. I don't, I don't think I would have used the inverters otherwise anyway. Um, and we've just got the connector going from the nano to that. Uh, the bar chart is just driven by a shift register, and because it's 10, 10 uh, bars, whatever, levels, I'm also using two digital pins, so there's a little bit of logic in here to figure out how to do that. But that's all there is to that, and here is the, the sensor, um, the two transistors. So, um, yeah, that's roughly how it works. I'm going to remove this USB, obviously, and just hook up a battery or something like that. But on the whole, quite pleased with it. Um, We'll see how useful it turns out to be. Uh, I need to figure out something to do for the potentiometer to do, um, and maybe this section of the display. But yeah, on the whole, it seems to work.